At 28,000 feet on Mount Everest, a climber makes a decision that will kill him. The weather is perfect. His equipment is functioning normally. He should survive this climb. He won't. The difference between life and death on Everest is not a storm or a fall. It's 30 minutes. Stay 30 minutes too long, and the brutal arithmetic of high-altitude survival ensures you will die. Most people think the death zone kills climbers because there isn't enough oxygen. That's wrong. The death zone doesn't kill you because of where you are. It kills you because of how long you stay. This isn't about courage or preparation. This is about a simple equation that runs out of solutions the moment your hypoxic brain decides to ignore the numbers. Every mountaineering guide will tell you the death zone begins at 8,000 meters, roughly 26,247 feet. They'll explain that at this altitude, the air pressure is only one third of what it is at the beach. The human body cannot survive indefinitely here. All of this is true. What they won't tell you is that the death zone isn't the executioner, it's just the crime scene. The public believes climbers die in the death zone because their bodies shut down from lack of oxygen. Mountain documentaries show climbers gasping, stumbling, collapsing. The narrative is simple, go too high and your body fails. But this explanation misses the real killer entirely. Consider the data that mountaineering companies don't advertise. In 2019, 11 climbers died on Everest during the spring climbing season. Eight of those deaths occurred on days with perfect weather conditions. Seven of the 11 climbers who died were using supplemental oxygen systems that function properly throughout their climbs. Modern supplemental oxygen systems deliver enough gas to keep your organs working. Insulated clothing keeps you warm. The technology exists to survive at 29,000 feet for hours. Rob Hall, one of the most experienced Everest guides in history, died in 1996 with a working radio, adequate oxygen supplies, and clear weather. Scott Fisher, equally experienced, died the same day under similar conditions. Yet both made the same fatal error. They stayed too long. The problem is that hours become the enemy. At extreme altitude, every biological system in your body operates under stress. Your heart works harder to pump thickened blood. Your lungs labor to extract oxygen from thin air. Your brain functions on reduced fuel. These systems can maintain themselves for a limited time, but that time has hard boundaries. The mathematics are unforgiving. A climber's oxygen bottles contain a finite volume of gas. Each breath consumes a measurable amount. Weather windows close according to predictable atmospheric patterns. Daylight disappears at a fixed time regardless of. Where you are on the mountain is crucial. Most critically, the human brain's ability to make rational decisions deteriorates on a schedule that can be calculated with disturbing precision. This creates what experienced climbers call the arithmetic of survival. You have a certain amount of oxygen. You need a specific amount to reach the summit and return safely. Weather will remain stable for a set number of hours. Your cognitive function will remain reliable for a specific duration. When any of these variables shifts beyond acceptable parameters, the equation becomes unsolvable. The mountain doesn't need to throw a storm at you or break your equipment. It just needs you to miscalculate by 30 minutes. The death zone's real danger isn't that it's impossible to survive there. The danger is that it's a place where small errors compound into fatal consequences faster than the human brain can process them. Every minute spent above 8,000 meters increases your risk exponentially, not because the altitude is killing you, but because time is running out on multiple biological and logistical systems simultaneously. But what if I told you that even perfect timing cannot overcome the body's ultimate betrayal? The mathematics of summit day begin before dawn. At Camp 4, 26,000 feet above sea level, a climber straps on two oxygen bottles, each containing roughly 10 hours of gas at a flow rate of two liters per minute. The weather forecast shows a six hour window of stable conditions. Summit and back should take 12 hours total. Most climbers don't realize they're walking into a mathematical trap. They focus on the inspirational aspects of the climb, the personal achievement, the view from the top. But Everest operates according to a brutal physics that don't care about motivation. Here's the calculation that kills. 
At extreme altitude with supplemental oxygen, the human body can function reliably for approximately 12 hours before its core systems start breaking down completely. This isn't a guideline or an average, it's a biological countdown timer that starts the moment you leave Camp 4. 12 hours sounds reasonable until you break down what actually happens on summit day. The climb from Camp 4 to the summit typically takes 6 to 8 hours for a strong climber in good conditions. The descent takes 4 to 6 hours. Weather windows at 29,000 feet rarely last longer than 8 hours. Oxygen consumption increases dramatically if you encounter delays, traffic jams, or equipment problems. The arithmetic becomes lethal when these variables intersect. A climber who takes seven hours to reach the summit instead of six has already consumed an extra hour of oxygen and lost an hour of daylight. If weather deteriorates during the descent, forcing slower movement, oxygen consumption increases while available supply decreases. But the most dangerous calculation involves Turnaround times. Experienced guides set strict deadlines. If you haven't reached the summit by 1 p.m., you turn around regardless of how close you are on the mountain. This rule exists because the descent is statistically more dangerous than the ascent, and darkness makes everything exponentially worse. The 2019 Everest season provides a perfect case study in how small delays compound into fatal arithmetic. On May 22nd, a traffic jam formed near the summit as more than 200 climbers attempted to reach the top during the same weather window. The delay lasted approximately two hours. Two hours doesn't sound catastrophic, but at 29,000 feet, it rewrote every climber's survival equation. Those who had planned to summit at noon didn't reach the top until 2 p.m. Their turnaround time shifted from early afternoon to late afternoon. Their oxygen reserves, calculated for a 12-hour round trip, were now being consumed during a 14-hour expedition. Kalpana Das, an experienced Indian climber, summited that day at 3.15 p.m. She had the skill and equipment to make the climb safely under normal conditions, but the two-hour delay meant she began her descent with reduced oxygen reserves during the most dangerous part of the day. She died during the descent, not because she lacked experience or equipment, but because the mathematics of her situation had become unsolvable. The brutal reality is that every minute above 8,000 meters makes the problem worse, fast. Stay an extra hour, and your oxygen consumption doesn't just increase by one hour's worth of gas. Your body, operating under stress, begins consuming oxygen faster, your movement becomes less efficient. Your decision-making deteriorates, leading to more delays and higher consumption. Weather compounds this arithmetic mercilessly. A sudden wind increase from 20 to 40 miles per hour doubles the body's energy expenditure. Cloud cover that reduces visibility by half can double the time required for navigation. Temperature drops force the body to burn more calories and oxygen to maintain core temperature. Most climbers die not during dramatic disasters, but during quiet mathematical collapses, where their personal equation of oxygen, time, and physical capacity simply runs out of solutions. But if the math is so simple, why do the most experienced guides, the ones who know the rules, make the same fatal, irrational mistakes? The answer lies in the systematic shutdown of the organ they depend on most. The most insidious killer on Mount Everest isn't the cold or the thin air. It's the systematic shutdown of the organ climbers depend on most, their brain. Lack of oxygen starts attacking your brain the second you enter the death zone. At 8,000 meters, your brain receives roughly one-third the oxygen it needs for optimal performance. This isn't like being tired after a long day. This is like trying to solve complex mathematical problems while someone slowly turns down the power to your computer. The progression follows a predictable pattern that experienced climbers learn to recognize in others, but rarely identify in themselves. Stage one begins with subtle changes in judgment and reaction time. A climber might take slightly longer to clip into a safety rope or miscalculate the 
distance to the next anchor point. These errors seem minor, but at extreme altitude, minor errors compound rapidly. Stage two introduces false confidence, one of hypoxia's most dangerous symptoms. As oxygen levels drop, the brain's prefrontal cortex, responsible for risk assessment and decision-making, begins to malfunction. Climbers start making choices they would never consider at sea level. They ignore turnaround times. They push through obvious warning signs of exhaustion. They convince themselves that rules don't apply to their specific situation. Beck Weathers experienced this phenomenon during the 1996 disaster. An experienced climber and physician, Weathers understood the medical effects of altitude better than most. Yet, when his vision began failing due to the interaction between altitude and recent eye surgery, he made a decision that nearly killed him. He waited at 27,000 feet for his guide to return rather than descending immediately. At sea level, a doctor experiencing sudden vision loss would seek immediate medical attention. At extreme altitude, the same doctor's compromised brain convinced him to wait in the death zone for hours. The mathematics of that decision were clearly fatal, but hypoxia had disabled his ability to perform the calculation. Stage three brings high altitude cerebral edema, where the brain literally begins to swell inside the skull. Haste doesn't announce itself with dramatic symptoms. It creeps in through subtle changes in personality and judgment. Climbers become irritable, then confused, then make obviously irrational choices. David Sharp, a British climber who died in 2006, exhibited classic haste symptoms during his final hours. Multiple climbers passed Sharp as he sat in a limestone cave near the summit clearly in distress. Sharp had the physical capability to descend and the equipment to survive, but his swollen brain could no longer process the simple equation that staying meant death. The cruel irony is that haste impairs the very cognitive functions needed to recognize haste. It's like a computer virus that disables the antivirus software. By the time symptoms become obvious to the climber, their brain lacks the processing power to respond appropriately. High-altitude pulmonary edema compounds the cognitive collapse. Hapy fills the lungs with fluid, reducing oxygen delivery to an already starved brain. Climbers experiencing Hapy often describe feeling like they're drowning from the inside, but the reduced cognitive function prevents them from making the obvious choice to descend immediately. Exhaustion amplifies every aspect of cognitive failure, after climbing for 12 to 16 hours at extreme altitude, even a healthy brain struggles with complex decisions. Add hypoxia, and the brain's executive functions essentially shut down. Climbers lose the ability to weigh risks against benefits, to calculate time and distance accurately, or to recognize when their situation has become unsolvable. The most experienced climbers aren't immune to cognitive collapse. Rob Hall, with eight successful Everest summits, made a series of decisions during his final climb that contradicted everything he taught his clients about mountain safety. He stayed past his own turnaround time, ignored weather warnings, and remained with a struggling client when descent offered the only chance of survival. These weren't character flaws or momentary lapses in judgment. They were the predictable result of a brain operating under conditions that systematically disable rational thought. This cognitive breakdown reveals why experience means nothing against the mountain's arithmetic. But if the ascent is the hardest part, why do statistics show that 80% of all Everest fatalities happen after the summit? The answer is the descent trap. The summit photograph lasts 30 seconds. The descent takes six hours. Yet most climbers spend months preparing for the climb up and virtually no time thinking about the mathematics of coming down. This oversight kills more people than any other factor on Mount Everest. Statistics reveal a brutal truth that contradicts everything the public believes about mountaineering deaths. Roughly 80% of Everest fatalities occur during descent, not ascent. The summit isn't the most dangerous part of the climb. It's the moment when danger actually begins. The arithmetic explains why. By the time a climber reaches 29,032 feet, they have already consumed 60% of their oxygen supply and 70% of their physical energy reserves. Their cognitive function has been degraded by hypoxia for eight to 10 hours. Their body temperature has dropped, slowing reaction times and muscle response. Every biological system is operating in deficit mode. Now they have to reverse everything they just accomplished, but 
under exponentially worse conditions. Reaching the summit triggers a massive release of endorphins and adrenaline. Climbers experience what researchers call summit euphoria, a neurochemical high that temporarily masks exhaustion and impairs risk assessment. The brain interprets reaching the summit as mission accomplished, relaxing the hypervigilance that kept the climber alive during the ascent. This relaxation is fatal, but one man, during the deadliest disaster in Everest history, understood this arithmetic better than anyone. His controversial decision to descend alone is the reason he saved three lives. The summit is the halfway point of a round trip, not the end of the journey. But climbers' brains, already compromised by altitude and exhaustion, struggle to maintain the mathematical precision that descent requires. Consider what happens to the survival equation after summiting. Oxygen reserves are depleted. Weather windows are closing. Daylight is disappearing. Physical energy is exhausted. Yet the technical difficulty of the descent often exceeds the ascent. Climbers must navigate the same rock faces and ice walls they climbed up, but now they're facing downward, unable to see their foot and hand placements clearly. The Hillary Step, a nearly vertical rock face near the summit, illustrates this perfectly. Climbing up the step requires strength and determination. Climbing down requires precise foot placement and upper body control while exhausted, hypoxic, and often in deteriorating weather conditions. The margin for error disappears entirely. Anatoly Bukhrev, one of the strongest high-altitude climbers in history, understood this arithmetic better than most. During the 1996 disaster, Bukhrev descended rapidly after summiting, conserving energy and oxygen for potential rescue operations. Other guides criticized his decision to leave clients behind, but Bukhrev's mathematics proved correct. He remained strong enough to return to the death zone multiple times that night, ultimately saving three lives. The brutal reality is that celebration and relief become fatal distractions during descent. Climbers who maintain perfect focus for 10 hours suddenly allow their attention to wander at precisely the moment when precision becomes most critical. They take photographs when they should be moving. They linger to enjoy the accomplishment when every minute increases their risk exponentially. Weather compounds the descent trap mercilessly. Afternoon storms develop predictably in the Himalayas, usually beginning around 2 p.m. Climbers who summit late find themselves descending through deteriorating conditions with depleted resources. Visibility drops, winds increase, and temperatures plummet just as their ability to respond to these challenges reaches its lowest point. The mountain's final mathematical cruelty reveals itself in these final hours. Descent requires the same technical skills as ascent, but with half the physical capacity and a fraction of the cognitive function. The death zone doesn't kill climbers because of altitude. It kills them because of time, mathematics, and the systematic failure of human judgment under extreme stress. Subscribe for more forensic breakdowns of mountaineering's deadliest misconceptions.